Hi, welcome to this week's edition of Consider This, a very unique Bible study. I'm Pastor Cheryl and I want to welcome you. We're actually starting a new series. It's called Living on a Prayer and tonight's teaching is called Prayer That Can Change Your Life. But before we join Pastor Rick, I wanted to read you a little something. What is prayer? Prayer is our direct line with heaven. Prayer is a communication process that allows us to talk to God. He wants us to communicate with Him like a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Cell phones and other devices have become a necessity to some people in today's society. We have Bluetooth devices, Blackberries, and talking computers. These are means of communication that allow two or more people to interact, discuss, and respond to one another. To many people, prayer seems complicated, but it's simply talking to God. Well, now let's join Pastor Rick as he enlightens us more on prayer. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Well, great to have you with us. I'm Pastor Rick. Our new series called Living on a Prayer. Anybody uh, about my age out there that's watching, do you remember the song by Bon Jovi? Living on a Prayer. I'm living on a prayer. Ah, you know, God, Cheryl and I have been married for 41 years, and obviously we've always had God in our lives, even though that there were times where we didn't even know it. But I'll tell you, the last 12 months, you've heard me say this over and over again, we've seen the hand of God in just an absolutely amazing way, because we obviously came out here with no work and didn't know where we were going, and not necessarily where we were going, but what we were going to be doing, and God has met our needs. And uh, so what I want to do right now is I'm going to... Uh, start this whole teaching off with something called, I'm going to put up on the screen right now, it's called the Big Ask. Now, please don't get offended when you look at that. There's like a little K on the end of that. I know sometimes when I say that, when I'm preaching live, people are like, oh, but the Big Ask is the big, big question. Here's the Big Ask. If you got to spend 15 to 20 minutes with Jesus, and it was 2,000 years ago, and he was there in the flesh, what would you ask him? I mean, would you want him to know what heaven was like, or did you, would you want to know if there really is a hell, or would you want to know, um, you know, um, how he walked on water, or what he did, or what would you want to know? Well, what's really fascinating is in the scriptures, we have one of the apostles, uh, as Jesus is praying, he goes to him and he says this verse. Take a look at this. Sure, I'll read it to you right now. Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place. When he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. See, isn't it amazing that what they wanted to know more than anything else was how to pray. How to pray. And the reason that they wanted, because they saw him. They saw what he did and, and they, they saw him walk on water. They saw him raise the dead. They saw him heal the sick. And they knew that there was something behind his ability. He just was not a regular person. There was power in his life. He obviously had the power of God. They knew he was the real thing. Well, I'm going to put a slide up here, and I want you to read this and really understand this. Look at this slide and what it has to say. Nothing is more vital to your Christian life than prayer. I'll leave it up there live for a second. I'm going to say that again. Nothing is more vital to your Christian life than prayer. Now, we're going to spend the next four teachings talking about prayer, but what's real important is, you know, there are verses that I'm sure you've read when Paul says, you know, pray unceasingly, meaning never stop praying. Well, you can't walk around and, and pray on your knees all the time. I believe that prayer is just is hearing the voice of God and obeying the, 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 the voice of God. But the problem is, is some people make prayer way, way, way too complicated. And the number one problem of why people give up prayer is simply because you'll hear me teach this pattern all the time. Commitment comes from confidence, and confidence comes from competence. If you're not competent at something, you're not confident at something. And if you're not confident at something, then you're not committed to something. So what happens to people is people will get discouraged and say, I prayed, it doesn't work, I give up, I don't want to pray anymore. Well, it isn't that prayer doesn't work, it's the fact that you may have misconceptions about prayer, or you may not understand how to pray. Let's look at four misconceptions of prayer. They're coming up on the screen right now. Misconception number one, what is it, honey? A magic wand. The prayer is a magic wand. Well, it's that's rooted in pride. 
and, and, and this fact that you can just wave your wand and go, dear God, this is what I want. You know, your wish is my command. Like he's some sort of genie, you know, that, that is, is, is he's in the sky and he was made to just give you anything that you want. Well, that's really a misconception about prayer. I mean, we have a 14 year old daughter about ready to become 15 years old and we don't give her everything that she wants. And, and, and you know, there's, there's, there's conditions. In my second teaching, I'll be talking about the five conditions to answered prayer. And there's reasons that prayers don't get answered. But the misconception is that it's just, he, God is a genie and your, you know, your wish is his, you know, why would I say that? My wish is his command, you know, no, that's not what it is. Here's the second misconception is this. A first aid kit. That one's rooted in fear. This notion that, you know, all of a sudden things start going bad, we better pray. Well, it, it's kind of silly because, um, you know, we pray to stay connected to find out what we should be doing all the time with God. I remember that uh, when Cheryl's dad, he, we had to have the ambulance over a few times. And, you know, I remember the first thing that I always do, the minute I'd, I'd look at Cheryl and he'd start getting sick and I'd say, you call 911 and I'm going to go over there and pray. I don't believe that we should just sit there and totally rely on prayer and, you know, have people pass away because we're, we're, we're not being obedient to God. But I believe that, you know, somebody in the room needs to pray. And when the medics would show up, I would pray for them. I'd lay hands on them and just cast out fear and anything that would be going on with them. And you'd see everybody calm down. And they used to always say that they enjoyed coming to our house because we would, we would be very calm even though we were in the middle of a crisis. And the other thing is too, is we were very thankful for them. So prayer, and understand this, prayer is not a magic wand. And number two, prayer is not a first aid kit. Number three, here it is. A tug of war. That's when it's rooted in anger, when you're, you're feeling like you're arguing with God and you're saying, I want this, and you feel like he's not giving it to you. And there's a misconception about of prayer. If you lose your peace and you lose your joy over what you're asking for, God is not going to answer your prayer. You know, that's why the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God, seek first peace and joy. When you pray, you must be in peace and you must be in joy. And, uh, and God will answer your prayer, but you won't get your prayer answered if you're in anger. And last but not least is this one. A religious duty. That is when it is rooted in guilt. You know, like I have to pray. I'm going to have you try something this week. You know, we need to understand that who the sun sets free is free indeed. The Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. You know, you don't have to go to work. Yes, there are consequences for not going to work. I understand that. But you need to start saying to yourself, I choose to go to work. I choose to do this. I choose to do that. We are free to choose and you choose to pray. Now, here's the problem is, look at this slide here. Prayer should be a delight versus being a duty. Duty is that guilt thing. I have to pray. You know, being a delight, it's like when my wife comes home and she's been working all day, I don't sit down and go, oh, well, she's home. I guess I got to talk to her. You know, that would be a duty. Like, I guess I'm married and I got to do my marital duties. No, it's a delight. I want to find out how she's doing. When I wake up in the morning, the first thing I say is, good morning, Holy Spirit. And he many times will sit there and say, good morning, buddy. You know, the Holy Spirit does not talk to me in King James. Holy Spirit will tell me sometimes, you know, he'll say, hey, buddy. I go, what do you want me to do? And he'll say, why don't you lay in bed in a few minutes? Let's just talk. No, we'll have a little conversation. He'll talk to me and, you know, and, I, and I'll talk to him and find out what are, what are my guidelines? What should I be doing today? How was yesterday? You know, when a band steps on stage, they don't tune up at the end of the concert. They tune up at the beginning of the concert. That's why the best thing you can do is communicate with God the first thing in the morning. You know, when you take an hour to communicate with God, I call it your hour of power. See, prayer needs to be, take a look at this slide. Prayer needs to be enjoyed, not endured. You know, I remember when I first started to pray, I didn't know how to pray. I mean, I started praying for the president and the congressman, and I started at the top, and you know, the second day I prayed, I didn't want to go through all this again. I felt it was so useless to be praying for all this. I didn't understand what, how to pray. Well, we're going to begin this teaching here with understanding, as you look at this slide, the four, it's coming up, there we go, the four purposes 
a prayer. You know, one of my favorite teachers I've learned so much from, I mean, I've, there's people like Benny Hinn that I've learned a lot from and, and uh, Joyce Meyer and T.D. Jakes, but you know, one person I've learned so much about in prayer is Rick Warren. And one, one of the great books that I read at the beginning of my walk with Christ, where I really started to understand Christianity, was Purpose Driven Life. You know, it, when you understand the purpose of marriage, you know, purpose of marriage, a lot of people don't even know why they're married. Purpose of marriage is to help each other grow. I mean, the end goal is to make it to heaven. Well, we're here to, you know, if you don't understand purpose, then you'll find yourself arguing and doing ridiculous things. Well, we need to understand the four purposes of prayer. Here's the first purpose of prayer. Cheryl, would you read it? Dedication. It says prayer is an act. Well, put it up there again. Hey, we're a little fast here. Prayer is an act of what, Cheryl? Dedication. 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 You know, it, it, I would say it this way, that, uh, you know, when you're dedicated to your spouse, you want to communicate with them. You want to spend time with them. If, you're, if you have a, a, a lawyer in your life that's guiding you, you want to spend time and get some guidelines. What should I do and what shouldn't I do? If you have someone that's a good friend, you're dedicated to that friend. You want to get on the phone or you want to text or you want to email, but there's a sense of, you know, you're dedicated to that person, that Jesus is, is the reason that, that, that you're living. Take a look at this Bible verse, and there's two words at the top here. Prayer is devotion and dependence. It shows your devotion to God, and it shows your dependence. So would you read John 15, verses 5 through 9? I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Isn't that, isn't that powerful? You ask anything, you know, but there's a condition. We always say this when you learn the Bible. There's a promise, but there's also a premise. A premise comes before a promise. If you do this, I will do this. You know, and, and that's the number one thing is this dedication. If, if you are in Christ, and you know I do the sign of the cross all the time, and I grew up Catholic, but I put some meaning behind it. You, you know, you can't do anything in pride, you can't do anything in anger, you can't do anything in fear, and you can't do anything in guilt, but you can do all things in humility, in forgiveness, in faith, and in grace. When you're in Christ, it's amazing what can happen. What we need to understand is that unless the Lord builds your house, unless the Lord is in your life, you labor in vain. You do things in your life and you're real busy and they just all fall apart. You know, I like this picture here uh, that I'm put up here. It's about a little guy and he's out there. Now keep that picture up there. He's a little scuba diving guy and he's, at a, he's very deep. But notice where the bubbles, his lifeline, the only thing that separate, I mean, the only thing that's connecting him with the top is that little lifeline where his air is going through. If you break that lifeline, this guy is sunk. He's not going to live. That's the same with prayer. If you're disconnected from God through pride or through anger, through fear, through guilt, you can do nothing. Anything you'll do, you'll just blow your blessings. But you need to stay connected. Let's take a look now at number two, at what prayer is an act of what, Cheryl? Prayer is an act of communication. You're communicating with God. When you love somebody, you communicate. Number one, you're dedicated, you're devoted to somebody, you're dependent on somebody. And number two, you communicate with them. You talk to them. You know, we had a prayer group one time. I, uh, I was down in Tampa and I had a bunch of people down there who wanted, a, I was living in Orlando at a time, and they wanted a Bible study. And, you know, and everybody was gathered around in a circle and we were praying at the end. And, you know, one of the Pentecostal people, you know, were praying this really powerful and with all the do's and vows and the King James prayer and the Baptist pray and the Methodist pray. But this other lady who was very new at all of this, she, she said, well, I really don't know how to pray. And, and, and she said, but uh, let's bow our heads. And she bowed her head and she said, dear God, these are my friends. Can you make sure some good things happen to them? In Jesus name, she said. You know, the power of God broke out in that room. We all started to cry because she just communicated with total honesty to God. You know, you don't sit there and I would say, hey, you know, go talk to my wife for a second. Well, 
I've never communicated with your wife before. You just talk. That's why it's amazing that people will say, I don't know how to pray out loud. Well, you're just communicating. Take a look at this Bible verse and see what it says. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. That is so awesome. You take a look at the corners of that. There was these two words up there, it, you know, privilege. There you go. Thank you, Liv. Privilege and personal. Praying to God, communicating with God is a privilege that we're given. It shouldn't be something that, you know, we have to endure. And it's also very personal. I mean, you read the scriptures to know that this God knows every hair on your head. And it's just a very personal conversation. You know, I don't know how many times we've gone through financial things and I've talked to God and God has said, it's going to be okay. I'm going to take care of you. And it's amazing because, you know, I hear it and then yet, you know, it's so easy to slip away and not believe it, but he, he promises it in his word. But he also, the Bible says, my sheep know my voice. I hear him all the time. Whenever I take the time to just talk to him, he says, relax, it's going to be okay. In fact, you know, take a look at this picture here, the typical average family trying to communicate with each other, you know, just texting with each other. And I mean, this is what our world has come through. You know, they're sitting next to each other and they're not even communicating. Well, the comedy of that picture is the word Emmanuel means God with us. God is with you. He's with you right now and he wants to communicate with you. Let's take a look at number three, prayer. The next slide. Prayer is an act of what, honey? Supplication. Supplication. You know, God meets your needs. Now, I've always wondered sometimes, you know, why do we pray what we need? Doesn't God already know what we need? Well, here's what I came to realize. I asked the Lord one time, I said, don't you already know? He says, yeah, I don't want to make sure that you know what you need. Because, you know, like a kid who's crying, sometimes you, you're like, what do you want? What do you want? And you start giving them everything. You know, God is a God of order. And he wants to make sure you know what you need because God could answer prayers and we could be sitting there not thinking our prayers are getting answered. But if you know what you need, um, then you pray it and you say, Lord, this is what I really need. And so that when it gets answered, you'll know that it's coming from God. Take a look at this Bible verse here. Two words here before we, when we put the slide up, I want to talk about this there. Prayer is very practical. You know, meeting the rent, the creator of the universe can meet your rent. The creator of the universe can, can, can meet your financial needs, can meet your health needs and everything. That's why prayer is so powerful. Look what it says in Philippians 4. It says this. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know, it's amazing how anxious we are. You know, God wants us to, you know, Hebrews 4 talks about the rest of God and meaning that, yeah, there's a time for us to work, but we need to learn how to live our lives while resting in God. You know, it's amazing how, you know, my Olivia, when she was really young, we would get to, uh, um, uh, Epcot Center, we'd be on a ride or something, and, and she'd go, Daddy, what are we going to do for the next ride? And I'd go, Baby, we haven't even been on this ride yet. And she was always wanting to be on the next ride, and when she'd get on the next ride, she'd want to be on the next one. And that's what it means to be anxious. You're living and you're uptight. And you're always, you never want to be where you are, you want to be somewhere else. The Bible says to be anxious in nothing. God wants us to enjoy life excuse me, to live in the moment. God is not in the future. God is not in the present. He's in the now. In fact, take a look at this picture <coughs> as I grab a little water here. Mm. <laughs> I'm taking a rest right now. There's a person that isn't very uptight right now. You know, when you pray to God, you need to learn how to just relax and enjoy life, not living in fear, not living in guilt, not being anxious, but living in the moment. Whoever's sitting on that horse right now is very much enjoying themselves. This is what God wants us to do. Enjoy life. Let's look at number four, last but not least. Prayer is an act of? Cooperation. Cooperation. You know, when I was a motivational speaker, <clears throat> excuse me a little bit, I have a little frog in my throat here. I'm going to cooperate with this water. 
When I was a motivational speaker, it seemed that everything was all about me. If it's going to be, it's up to me. And I think the sad thing about the way I was teaching back there, it was about you were totally responsible for your life. Well, I remember meeting a lady one time, an elderly lady, and she walked up to me and she said, Rick, call me Mr. Rick back there, and she said, Mr. Rick, two things you need to know. Number one, there is a God, and number two, it's not you. That was the beginning of my walk with God. You know, an and amazing thing is, and then there's people that are Christians that will just say, well, God is going to take care of it, and God is going to take care of it. That's an unbalance, too. There is a cooperation between you and God. That's why you'll see what I teach at the end. You'll understand. Cooperate means to operate and do what God wants you to do. But, you know, we work together with God. The Bible says faith without action or faith without works is dead. Take a look at this Bible verse here. The Bible says, Believe. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do greater things than these because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son, you may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. You see those two words at the top of the screen? Amazing and awesome. That's the God we serve. I have just seen so many amazing things. When I, I look back, when we ran a church, I remember saying to my family one time, I said, you know, I thought there was a problem where we were running a church. There was no problem. There never is a problem. It's all good. But you know, it's amazing when you live in fear and you live in, in guilt and you live in anger, you think there's a problem. We, we are so blessed in our lives, but yet we create these problems because we don't know how to stay connected to God. So remember this, that it's prayers about dedication to God. Prayers about communicating with the person that you love. Prayers about supplication. This is the purpose of prayer. And last but not least, prayer is this cooperation. You know, sometimes they say a picture is worth a thousand words. You know, working together is incredibly important. Take a look at this cat and dog finally working together to get what they want. That is a wonderful picture of cooperation. You know, the Bible says that... Uh, you know, well, I'm going to give you that verse in a second. But the, the point that I, I want to make about all of this is that it's real easy to just, you know, when, when you're not committed to just give up on something and just start complaining and whining and just think that, you know, life isn't good and I don't think we're going to make it. And, you know, I'm not making the money that I used to make. And, you know, whoa, 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 wait a minute here. We're about cooperating with God. Here's, you know, when, I love when the Bible says something you know, and it says it three times. So I put this up on the screen. This is so important. Look at this little Rickism here. It says, never, never, never give up. And I'll prove to you why you should never give up when you're praying on things. You know, a lot of people think like, well, I've asked God and that's it. And, you know, I prayed for that for a month. And, you know, I had a lady one time, we were one of the first services, search, churches, I should say, that we worked in. A lady called up and told my wife she'd heard us preach. And she said, you know, I've been praying for my husband for like, Three months, she said, and frustrated and nothing has ever happened. And my wife, you know, very humbly responded to her. She said, I prayed for my husband for 10 years and I didn't see any results whatsoever. Well, you know, it's very important sometimes that, uh, you know, many times that we just don't give up. You don't give up on yourselves. You don't give up on your spouses. You don't give up on your children. Take a look at this Bible verse and it'll talk you about how important it is for us not to give up and to pray. And he said to them, which of you shall have a friend? and go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Because of his persistence. Mm -hmm. Because of his persistence. I think the best way to describe it is like children who ask for a puppy dog, you know. You've been in a store with a little 
with your with your kid. Daddy, I want a puppy. You know, we can't have a puppy. Daddy, I want a puppy. Please, these look so cute. I mean, kids are incredible when they're really young. You know, under the age of ten, and they ask. They are so persistent and so sweet when they ask. You know, we we have a term in our house. We call it being pleasantly persistent. And here's you know, last couple points that I want to make about this is take a look at this slide right here. Learn the importance of agreement. That's why the devil, you know, has people fighting so much because there's such a power when people agree. I mean, if you're going to be watching TV and you both agree on watching the same movie, if you're going to eat and you all agree on, you know, what you're going to eat for food, but watch the power of agreement in prayer. Take a look at this Bible verse as my wife reads it for you right now. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Whew. The power of agreement. Now you understand why the devil has people fighting and fighting with their children and fighting with family and stuff like that because there's just such power when we come with agreement in prayer. You know, I, I, I feel like it's, I, I feel in my spirit I need to say this. There's somebody out there right now who's watching and, and, and you have a tendency to complain about this person. This person is frustrating you beyond belief and you don't know what to do. This is what prayer is about. When you get to a point with a person and you can't seem to tolerate uh, you know, their behavior, here's the most important thing you can do is pray for them. If the prayer doesn't change them, the prayer will change you. And what's most important to learn, like, you know, faith without works, take a look at this next slide right here, is simply this. Remember to learn. It's coming up here. You must, what's it say, Cheryl? Pray, Pray and, and obey. obey. You know, most of the time when I hear God's voice, it's, you know, I'll be praying for something and then God will say, well, you need to do this. That's the cooperation. I need to do that. Well, you need to invite this person out to eat. You need to make this phone call. You need to send a letter. You need to just do, do something. You know, because the Bible, the, you know, at the end of your life, you won't look and, and be, faced, be facing Jesus to have him say, well, well prayed about. He will say, well done, my good and faithful servant, because you've prayed, you've gotten your direction for God, and there's something that he's asking you to do. Now, before we be close, I hope this has helped you tonight. But before we close, obviously my, my favorite prayer is the Lord's Prayer. But I went through the scriptures and I found uh, three prayers. And some people, I had a man come up in Bible study when I did this last week. He said, you know, I've read Proverbs over and over again. And I never saw this in Proverbs as a prayer. So I'm going to read three of my favorite all-time prayers. Here's prayer number one, and I'm going to read them to you. Favorite all-time prayers. This one is from Proverbs 30, verses 7 through 9. It says this, Oh God, I beg two favors from you. First, help me never to tell a lie. Second, give me neither poverty nor riches. For if I grow rich, I may deny you and say, Who is the Lord? And if I am too poor, I may steal and thus insult God's holy name. Second favorite prayer here. It's on two pages. Thank you, Liv. Here it is. This is us. This is, I believe this is St. Augustine. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. You hear us read this many times in the Good News Show. Where there is abuse, let me bring love. Where there is hurt, let me bring forgiveness. Where there is doubt, let me bring faith. Where there is despair, let me bring hope. Where there is darkness, let me bring light. Where there is sadness, let me bring joy. And the second part. Dear God, help me that I focus not so much on being comforted, but that I may comfort others. Not to be understood, but that I may understand others. Not that I am loved, but that I love others. For it is in the giving that we receive, for it is in the forgiving that we are forgiven. It is in the dying to self that we are born into a meaningful life. In Jesus' name we pray. And the last one, which is so great at the dinner table. Dear God, Bless the food before us. Bless the family beside us. Bless the friendships between us. In Jesus' name we pray. Well, next week I am going to be teaching on, I hope you've enjoyed this tonight, but next week I'll be teaching on the five conditions of answered prayer. 
And before we close, what I'd love to, my wife to do, this few people in my li life that I just love the way they pray. One of them is a pastor down here. His name is Pastor Cletus. I just love the way he prays. He's part of the prayer team. The other person who I just so enjoy the way she prays is my wife. So I'm going to have her look into her camera, and she's just going to close our, uh, our uh, Bible study off with prayer tonight. Thank you. Yes. Father God, I pray right now that each one hearing my voice and, and having listened to this Bible study tonight will truly in their heart deep down know that God wants to be your friend and he wants a friendship with you. And it's just like talking to a friend when you talk to God. And I pray right now that you will just be able to communicate with God on a one-to-one -one basis at any time, anywhere, without any fear, any guilt, without any pride, without any anger. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.